The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hope everyone had a great Veterans Day break yesterday, spending it, of course, as um, I check my test on Ian, spending it mostly doing your opera research or PSATs, but at least one person got to watch TV, so at least one person got to have a real break, and that's something truly amazing and special. So now we're going to talk about SVMs. They're pretty much the hardest thing in 604. However, in recent um, in recent years, a few shortcuts have popped up that will sometimes allow you to solve the question depending on what they're asking for without solving some vast, ugly set of equations with a vast, ugly number of unknowns. So I'm going to show that to you guys. I'm also going to try to explain all of the alphabet soup that's in neural nets and what all the letters stand for because uh, it took me a few times going through, uh, going through uh, SVMs. It took me a few times going through SVMs to actually find out for sure what all those letters stood for. And if you guys figure it out first try, that's going to be great. And you guys will be just fine. So let's take a look at the problem that's perhaps most optimized for using some of the shortcuts to solving it. And, um, not putting up all of the equations. Then I will, because I am, not because I'm sadistic, but because I'm being nice, I will force you with me to solve um, some of the things they didn't ask for us to solve so that you can see that you can't get away with everything without um, doing some of the harder stuff. And of course, definitely ask questions as always, but this time even more so. You guys, well, if you were looking around, you saw nobody in this um, entire lecture hall raised their hand that they're already um, set and ready and no SVMs. So if you have a question, maybe everybody else does. So let's go. You'll start right here. As always, pretend that I can draw and that therefore all the pluses and minuses are only on integer um, coordinates. So we are asked in this problem to circle the support vectors, draw the edges of the street, and then the dotted line in the middle that separates them, the separator, um, as a dashed line. And then to give W and B. So what are W and B? Well, there's a few important equations in um, in SVMs that we really hope, and I'm going to tell you we're lucky in this because we don't have to, but we really hope that we don't have to use because they provide a huge number of variables. So one of those um, crucial equations is that for a, for a plus support vector, w vector dot x plus the plus support vector plus b equals 1 w dot x minus plus b equals minus 1. And w dot, that dotted line, I don't know, we'll call it dot, 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 plus b equals 0. So what does this mean? There are a lot of vectors. Well, I mean, we're usually in two-dimensional space, so we can basically just say that there's two components of this w vector, w1 and w2. And they're just two coefficients and a linear equation. So to get, uh, for instance, what we're interested in finding, this dot, dot, dot line, we'll just call that x with nothing on it, actually. Maybe that'll be easier. This is equivalent to saying w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b equals 0, where x1 is this and x2 is this. We would possibly call them x and y. So one way to think about it is, you know, w1, we call it a, ax plus 
call W2 B, BY. Oh, don't call it B. Well, AX plus CY plus B equals, I'll put this all in parentheses. This is basically an equation like this, or, you know, Y equals um, negative A over C X minus B over C. It's basically Y equals MX plus B. Does everyone see that? This thing that we're looking for, this W dot X plus B equals zero, is the equation of a line on in Cartesian coordinates. It just looks uglier. Normally, um, when we were doing all this solving for W and B, we would have to put in equations with the um, tons of equations, plug in all of the support vectors in there, and we'd have to use these little devils called alphas, which um, alphas, essentially, if it wasn't clear in the lecture, which it usually isn't completely clear to everyone, wasn't clear to me completely, alphas, the way I like to think about them, the alphas in this problem, is they are the weight of how significant any particular point on the graph is towards creating the boundary. This, the higher the alpha is, the more that that point narrows in the boundary. The lower the alpha is, the less that that point narrows in the boundary, the wider the road can be. And if that point doesn't do anything, if that point is irrelevant and could be removed and wouldn't affect the boundary, the alpha is, everyone, Zero. Well, that was one person, but you can suffice for everyone. The alpha is zero, and that means if it's not a support vector, if it's not one of the vectors on the boundary lines, it will always have an alpha of zero because it doesn't affect. So keeping that in mind, there's a few fun and important equations about alphas that we'll need if we're solving many equations for many unknowns, which hopefully we won't have to do. The sum over the positive alphas equals the sum over the, the alphas of the negative points. This is true over all the points, but since all of the alphas are zero except for the support vectors, it also means the alphas of the positive support vectors are equal to the alphas of the negative support vectors. Additionally, our old buddy the w vector is equal to the sum over the all i that are plus vectors of w i alpha i minus I'm over j minus vectors of w j alpha j. Now all of these equations can be used in a bloody mess to um, figure out the answer to what we're trying to find, which is circle the, well, actually, they can't be used to circle the support vectors and draw the, um, draw the dotted line. But once we do that, all of these equations can be used in a bloody mess to give us the, what, the next thing that we want, which is W and B. Um, so fortunately, there's another way to get W and B. If you guys really want, at the, at the end of the hour, we can also try to, get, uh, try to derive W and B using the many equations and many unknowns. But it's a bit painful. We'll try to do it the cool way. So let's start off. This is the one we're looking at. We need to find where the support vectors are. So the first thing we need to do is simply eye it. Fortunately, on the test, there will always be ones that you can eye if you're supposed to circle the support vectors. There's obviously some number of pluses and some number of minuses. I say obviously, but maybe not. But hopefully, obviously, and we'll find out, because I'm going to call them random people. So give me um, a positive support vector. Which plus sign of the three? The, uh, you know, the, the one on the right. The one on the right. Yeah, that, that plus sign is a positive support vector. That's good. All right, excellent. Uh, now, give me a negative support vector. That one? No? Ah, no problem. Give me a negative support vector. Oh yeah, I was about to ask you, what's a support vector? <laughs> that is a good question. 
question is, what is a support vector? How many other people uh, will admit to having this question? See, you're not alone. OK. Before I go on, I'm going to assume, guys, make sure I'm correct. Monday was, um, um, just being sure so I can tailor it based on this, Monday was the support vector machine lecture. Um, but it was also very difficult to follow. That's what I, that's what I usually expect. So um, what is a support vector? Well, all these pluses and minuses, if we were, if we were me, and we, if, I guess, yeah, if we were me and if I was describing this problem, the one that we work out in class, I would call them points. Because they're on the graph, they're points, they're data points. I would call, but however, in more difficult versions of this problem that have n dimensions, where n is some ridiculous number of dimensions that you're never going to graph, like say, you know, some of the research I'm doing now, I could use support vector machines on some of these articles that uh, I'm reading about cyber events to try to figure out if there's a real event or if it's just someone complaining about how we're really vulnerable or something like that and no event actually happened. So the reason why they call these guys vectors is when you're not able to graph them on a Cartesian plane, there's still this long you know, vector of many different dimensions. Right now, though, these points represent the vectors. It's just very simple. It's easier to view them this way. But for instance, that plus at negative 1, 2 represents the fact that there's a vector going in the direction of negative 1, 2 with a magnitude su such that it reaches negative 1, 2. So all of these points are just the point representation of vector. You probably, in any class that worked with vectors, saw this, saw vectors being represented as points. Question? Always from respect to the origin. Uh, yes. The question is always with respect to the origin. The answer is canonically when vectors are represented as points, yes, it's always with respect to the origin. So that's the basic idea is that all these points are vectors. So what are support vectors? Well, you could call them support points for this case. But the reason we call them support vectors is, again, in the generalized case that you might be doing in the real world with real AI, you're going to have a giant vector. It's not just going to be points on a graph. Uh, well, usually. So the support vectors, the support points, we found one of them correctly. It's this guy. They're going to be the ones that Again, they don't have an alpha of zero. They're the ones that bind in the, as Patrick calls it, the road, the boundary lines. They're going to be on the edge of plus, whichever direction we draw it. This plus is the edge of the plus region. If we made this the edge of the plus region, and everything on this side is plus and everything on this side is minus, we'd be screwed because there's two pluses on the, um, on the other side of that. Generally when trying to find the support vectors, you do something a little bit similar to my crazy method of uh, doing nearest neighbors and try to find a plus minus, <coughs> excuse me, a plus minus pair that's close to each other. Sometimes, though, it's not just two points. Because sometimes if you try to draw the simple-minded thing, which is sort of the perpendicular bisector of the two points, you get screwed because there's another point in your way. So now that I've given away a clue, Let's go, um, and hopefully that made sense to you guys. The support vectors are the ones on the edges that are just barely a, a plus for sure, or just barely a minus for sure. Let's go back. Can you give me a negative support vector? Hmm? The one on the top left? Yes. And does anyone think that there's a third support vector? Well, let's simple-mindedly try the thing that, remember, support vectors always attempt to have the widest possible space between the pluses and the minuses that they can. So let's simple-mindedly try to do the um, perpendicular bisector and see if, it, see if it screws us over. So when we simple-mindedly do the perpendicular bisector, it goes through like here, like this, and it's just fine. So these are the only two support vectors.
and there's our divider line. So we're on the home stretch, but we have to find W and B. In olden days, we would find W and B by plugging in W dot the plus support vector plus B equals 1. Oh, that's very crucial. These W dot plus X plus X minus are only true equaling 1 or negative 1 are only true for support vectors. It's always true that w dot any positive point plus b will be some positive number, but it won't always be it won't always be one. In fact, it will always be greater than one up over here. It will always be less than negative one down over there. So, in olden days, we would plug in negative one two into this equation. We would plug in three negative two into this equation, we plug in alpha plus equals alpha minus it's the sums, and since there's only one plus and one minus, we know that they were equal. And then we fidget around with this W equation. However, there is a better way to do it. And so let's use this cheap strategy to solve, um, to solve this uh, version of the SVM. Here's how. First, and I know I didn't draw these completely straight, sorry, uh, but can anyone by looking at the fact that this is 3, negative 2, and this is negative 1, 2. Can anyone tell me what the equation, uh, if you can do y equals mx plus b, can anyone tell me what the equation of that dotted line is supposed to be if I was good at drawing? Uh, people say y equals x minus 1, and I say yes, y equals x minus 1. So therefore, the pluses would be y is greater than or equal to x minus, uh, x minus 1. Indeed. So we've already seen that w dot x plus b like somehow can be converted into this form. Right? So therefore, if we have y equals x minus 1, then we know that we have in w1, that we know that um, we have w dot x plus b equals 0. Let's do that here. So we know that w1, w1, x1, we can even call it x and y, I think it'll be fine. No one will come after us. w2, y plus b equals 0. But we also know that y equals x minus 1, which means that um, if y equals x minus 1, then that means that according to this thing that we have over here, then negative w1 over w2 equals, um, so we know that negative w1 over w2, and we have negative, uh, negative b over w2. So y equals x minus 1. And if we solve this equation to make it look like this, we would have y equals negative w1 over w2 minus b over w2. So we know that in some way, shape, or form, that um, we know that, neg that then, therefore, w1 over w2 is some scalar multiple of minus 1. And we know that b over w2 is, in fact, some scalar multiple of positive 1. Scalar multiple, what is scalar multiple? Well, why is it a scalar multiple? Why isn't it just going to be negative 1 or positive 1? Because um, just because in this equation we can multiply the entire equation by any number and it'll still have the same boundary line. You guys see that? If, if you know, if, um, oh yeah, there's an x here. If we multiplied everything, since it's all divided by w2, if we doubled w2, but also w doubled b and w1, it would be the exact same equation. Do you guys agree? So there's, in fact, infinitely many possible equations. And you say, well, great, Mark. You figured out what form it is. So you figured out that w1 over w2 equals um, some scalar multiple of, of negative 1. So it's negative 1 times. What's everyone's favorite letter? K. K, negative 1 times K. 
and we figured out that B over W2 is, I guess we can just do negative K, is positive K. But what's K? How are we going to figure it out? Well, it's a good question. I will tell you how. I will assert the following fact as true without proof. Then I will not prove it. Um, 1 over the magnitude of W, which is this vector here with W1 and W2, equals this, where this is that line that I just drew, the line from here to this point. One over the magnitude of W equals this. Therefore, since one over the magnitude of W equals this, and this equals, I believe, two root two, because we're going over two, down two, Pythagorean theorem, two root two. So therefore, flip everything over. Magnitude of W equals 1 over 2 root 2. So therefore, magnitude of W equals root 2 over 4. But why are we OK? Well, how do we calculate the magnitude of W? Do people know, um, in general, magnitudes of vectors? Generally, for these vectors, we do it by taking the square root of the sum of the components squared. So the square root of w1 squared plus w2 squared equals root 2 over 4. But that's not all. That's not all, we say, because we know from this over here that the ratio of w1 and w2 is, yeah, the, the ratio of the, the ratio of W1 and W2 is going to be, actually, sorry, I shouldn't put a K here. I realize I sh probably should have been confusing you guys a lot. W1 over W2 is just negative 1. B over W2 is just 1. That's just a fact. There's no K. The K is to determine what W1 and W2 is, W1 and W2 are. So W1 equals like negative k, and W2 equals positive k, and then B equals also positive k. By the way, here's a question for you. Could I have put the k, the negative sign on a different, uh, I could have put the negative sign on W2 and B instead of on W1? So many people said yes. That's a very smart answer. Actually, no. Um, because of the fact that the pluses are on the negative x-axis, it's just a, a little trick I picked up. When one of them is negative and the other one isn't, follow the pluses. So we know that w1 is negative k, w2 is positive k, and b is positive k. w1 over w2 is negative 1, b over w2 is positive 1. So what do we know about the ratio of w1 and w2? It's equal to negative 1. And that means that when we square it, w1 squared equals w2 squared. So therefore, this is the square root of 2w1 squared, which equals root 2w1. Equivalently, well, actually, no, it doesn't equal root 2w1 because w1 is actually negative. So it we can, you know, it's negative root 2 w1, it doesn't matter. The point is that if that equals root 2 over 4, then w1 is, everyone? Negative 1 fourth. Bingo. And if w1 is negative 1 fourth, everything else falls into place. What are w2 and b, everyone? Positive 1 fourth. We got it. We're done with this part of the problem. However, bonus, let's do, calculate the alphas, which they didn't ask you to calculate. Actually, you know what? We'll do the alphas if we have enough time, since they didn't actually ask you to calculate them. However, my recommendation is, since there's only one alpha plus and one alpha minus, they must be equal from this equation, since the sum of the alpha plus equals the sum of the alpha minus. And so therefore, sum of the w, uh, sorry, w equals the sum of w, sorry, this should be an x. 
of course, there's not a million Ws in this equation. The sum of the points, the positive data points times their alphas minus the negative data points times their alphas. So we're looking at here um, negative 1 quarter, 1 quarter equals, um, what have we got here? Positive point, negative 1, 2. So we've got alpha plus, or alpha of that point, negative 1, 2 minus alpha of that minus point, and what is that? It's 3, negative 2. 3, negative 2. So if both of the alphas which are equal were 1, we'd have negative 4, uh, we'd have negative 4, 4, but we want negative 1 quarter, 1 quarter, so actually both of the alphas are one sixteenth, And that's the answer. We'll do that more in depth if we have time, but we won't. So let's do number two. So let's go into faster mode. Number two, very similar to number one in many ways, but as you can see, one of the main things is they added an extra minus sign at two negative one. So I think we can all agree that this will still be our plus. Actually, they added another plus sign there, too. So maybe this plus sign is a support vector, but it's not. This plus sign is a support vector. What do you guys think about the new negative sign? Will it become the support vector since it is like strictly closer to the pluses? Yep, you're right. OK. So this is a very beautiful division because if I drew this correctly, which I didn't, but if we pretend that I did, then the dotted line is y equals x. OK, so with the dotted line at y equals x, then we know that just like we did up here, we know that um, if y equals x plus 0, we know that first of all, b equals 0. Second of all, we know that we've got um, just if y equals x, then we know that um, negative w1 over w2 equals 1. The pluses are still on the left and up, so we know that w1 is some negative number, negative k, and w2 is some positive number, k. Great. How are we going to figure it out? Well, let's call that this d for distance, or whatever you want to call it. So n over w equals d. d in this case is not um, 2 root 2. Can everyone tell what d is here? Actually, so it goes over 2 and 1, so it should be 1 and a half root 2, since this with distance, which is twice as much, goes over 3 and 3, which is 3 root 2. So it's 1 and a half root 2. I don't like um, putting in decimals and stuff there, so we'll say that 2 over magnitude of w equals 2d equals 3 root 2. So therefore, um, right, Pythagorean 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 3 root 2. So therefore, magnitude of w equals, uh, let's see, switch them over. We should get root 2 over 3. And if magnitude of w is root 2 over 3, we can do our same trick from before. Square root of 2w2 squared equals root 2 over 3. And this is just root 2 times w2 equals root 2 over 3. So therefore, w2 is 1 third, and w1 is negative 1 third. Bingo. We've got w1, we've got w2. We know that b was 0 because. Obviously, it's 0. It's y equals x. And we're done. Ah, that was fast. The alphas might have taken longer. Actually, the alphas on this one are more of a pain in the ass than anywhere else. Because let's take a look at this one, if you can see it. 
we've added in so yet some new points. We've got this point up here and this point down there. So I think pretty clearly this plus and minus are the closest to each other. But what happens if we take the perpendicular bisector between these two and do like this? This plus is in the middle. So we're going to have to figure, so therefore this plus is going to have to also be a support vector. So we can't just draw this line. We have to include this. What's our best division? Vertical lines, that's right. Vertical lines, just so. And that means that the equation of our, um, the equation of our boundary, the dotted line here, y-axis. So if the equation of the boundary is the y-axis, then b equals 0, and hell, w2 equals 0. So the only thing that is not ah, w2 equals 0. So w2 equals 0, b equals 0, but w1 is not equal to 0 because it's just the equation of the y-axis. So um, we therefore know that the equation is just w1 times x equals 0. So if w1 times x equals 0, and we know that that just means essentially that x is going to be some k, it's also going to be negative because of the fact that the pluses are still on the left, then um, we're going to have to figure out what that k is. We'll use our old trick. By this point old, hopefully, 1 over magnitude of w equals d. This time, d is just 1. So therefore, magnitude of w equals 1. There's only one component in w, so therefore w1 is minus 1, because the pluses are on the left. People see that? Not too bad. This one's easy to calculate the w, but it's not as easy to get all of the alphas. But let's move on to a new and even more fun, maybe not, um, question, which is this guy. As you can see, this is a, this, well, maybe not, this is a one-dimensional vector. These vectors only have a single dimension, so it just looks like a number line here. That dimension varies from, it looks like, negative 9 to positive 9. It just has one component. You don't have to worry about any of these crazy magnitudes with two components. Just everything has a single component. However, it's obvious that a linear basis line is going to completely screw us up here, since lines at this point are just like, glump, all of these are pluses, all of these are minuses. Well, that, great, that doesn't get them all. So how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to use what is usually perhaps the hardest thing in SVMs, but in this case is not going to be too bad for us. We're going to use a kernel. Now, based on how little I understood kernels the first time uh, I took this class, I'm guessing that you guys would like to have some explanation on these kernels. You probably saw them. You remember the kernels from um, Patrick's lecture vaguely? They're like this phi, and then there's this k, and then they get really complicated. OK, so here's how the kernel works. The basic idea is this. And I'll write it over here. Oh, wow, there's more stuff. OK, I'll write it right here. The basic idea is this. We're taking the normal space, which is you know, this number line, or it could be any kind of normal space, and we're going to take a vector. We're going to put it into a, a, a function called phi. And phi of vector x brings x into some new dimension. Phi, or phi if you like it better, is usually a nasty piece of work and something that you'd never ever want to look at. Sometimes it's not too bad. Phi is the function that brings it into the new dimension. OK? And when you brought the data into a new dimension, sometimes you can just cut a straight line in that dimension, and you'll just be happy. However, something that was noted by the very, very smart inventor of support vector machines is that you don't actually need 
to, um, to work with function phi, even if phi is an absolutely horrible monstrosity, because of the fact that you never need to know what the vector x, what all these vectors x actually are in the new space, at least not directly. In none of these equations up here do we ever use x by itself. However, we do use x being dot product with something else. So he figured out a very sneaky and excellent shortcut. OK, so oh, I shouldn't use x1, x2. I'll use x and um, uh, z. So if you have two vectors, x and z, which are in a regular space, you put them into this function called the kernel, then it will tell you phi of x dotted with phi of z. And if you have that, you don't need phi. Does everyone see that? Does everyone see why we don't need phi? Look at all these equations up here. We would never look at x by itself in these, um, in these vector equations, at least. Now, calculating alphas, yeah, that gets a little bit fuzzy. But in the vector, but in the vector equations, also, you, yeah, you may ask, like, why would you do this? You can't calculate the alphas. It turns out we're, um, that actually, other than for these very simple linear problems, human minds cannot calculate the alphas. In fact, you run a very complicated quadratic optimization. In fact, finding out the best al alphas is the thing that you hill climb on when you're doing SVMs in the real world. You say, all right, I'll run my, uh, my algorithm on I know there's only one peak, which is very, very good, because it's quadratic optimization. Let me figure out the alphas. So in fact, it doesn't matter that you can't do the, use these alpha equations to figure out the alphas um, if you've gone into, you, if you only know the kernel function, not the phi function, because normally the computer figures out the alphas for you um, with quadratic optimization. Just in these simple problems, we know you can calculate the alphas. So we have the kernel which replaces the dot, basically gives us the dot product of the things in the new space. So being that as it may, I'll give you the kernel here. I'd like you to give me the phi. So a kernel for, a, someone got an idea, whose name was Susan Q, random student, apparently. She got an idea that if we had a kernel for x and z, actually, they're not vectors, I guess. They're just single components. And the kernel equals cosine pi over 4 x times cosine pi over 4 z plus sine pi over 4 x plus sine pi over 4 z. So that is the new dot product. Cosine pi over 4x. Oh, wait, sorry, I put one of the z's not inside of the parentheses. That was silly of me. So, cosine of the quantity pi over 4x times cosine of the quantity pi over 4z plus sine of the quantity pi over 4x plus sine of the quantity pi over 4z. It's the new dot product. So, that begs the question in this one, this is an easy one, so we can calculate the phi. What is phi of x? We're actually taking it from one dimension, and we may be playing around with it a lot to get this. And this thing has become a new dot product. It replaces dot product. Now, remember that the dot product for scalars would have just been multiplying the two numbers together. So it actually makes it a little bit more complicated. Does anyone think they know the phi? Ah, we've got one. What do you think? It's x to the cosine. You mean to become a vector, two-dimensional? Absolutely. That's exactly correct. How would you have solved this on the actual quiz if you're not our brave volunteer? Well, that k, if you squint at it, not very much, actually, is pretty much a dot product between cosine pi over 4s and sine pi over 4s. I mean, look at it. Dot product is just, remember, if the dot product of x and z vectors is x1, is x1, z1 plus x2, z2, 
So that basically is x1, z1 plus x2, z2. Oh, this should have been a times. Yeah, this should have been a times. Sorry, there's a plus there. Anyone who missed it because of that, my bad. That should have been a times. There should have been times up there. The pl only plus is it's cosine pi over 4x cosine pi over 4z plus sine pi over 4x times sine pi over 4z. So yeah, it's basically the dot product between cosine pi over 4x and sine pi over 4x. Bingo. All right, last thing. And then we, well, we're not done yet because we're going to maybe ask some questions and then we're going to see if we can calculate those alphas. But last thing, let's graph in this new dimension all the points. So obviously cosines and sines. So we're going to get results between 1 and minus 1. Let's see, maybe I can graph it. Um, did I write on all of these? Wait, maybe this one. Oh, no, people drew weird stick figures there. OK. Oh, yeah, this one's kind of messy, but we'll do it on this. OK, so we've got. This is 1, negative 1, 1 half, negative 1 half, or so 1 half, negative 1 half, 1, negative 1, negative 1 half, 1 half. OK? So given that, let's try to graph all of these points on this number line into this new, brave new dimension by using their cosine sine pi over 4. So all right, great. So let's do the pluses first. What about the plus at 0 is cosine 0, sine 0. So what is that? That's 1, 0. That's right. In fact, the 8 and the minus 8 are also that, times 3. The 8 and the minus 8 are also that because then it's just 2 pi and minus 2 pi, which, well, cosine and sine are periodic. OK, great. What about the 1? Well, that's cosine pi over 4, sine pi over 4. What's that? Yeah, it's root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. So it's something like here, we'll say. And in fact, the 9 and, um, the, 9 and the negative 7 are also that. So there's three of these two. OK. What about the negative one? That's cosine negative pi over 4 sine pi over 4. That's right. The x value is positive root, root 2 over 2, and the y value is negative. So, and again, there's three of them. All right, great. Now let's do the minuses. There's the minus at 3 which is also the same as the minus at negative 7. The minus at 3 is cosine 3 pi over 4, sine 3 pi over 4. Which one is that? So that's in the second, uh, yeah, that's going to be in the second quadrant. We're going to have the cosine is going to be negative, but the sine is going to be positive. And so we get three points here. And as you may have predicted, the other one, um, the 5 pi over 4, is in the third quadrant. We get three points here. What are the support vectors? Um, Question? Um, I understand where you're getting the three quantities of the plus in the first and fifth quadrants. But according to the bar line there, you know, like the total of four negative values. So oh, you're right. There's only two. Good call. There's two negatives here, and there's two negatives here. Good call. Doesn't change the problem. In fact, if we just graph more points, there might have been more. But there's a very subtle and important distinction. There are two negatives. But otherwise, yeah, these are graphed correctly. Does anyone see where the support vectors are? So the top two, the minus and the plus, we'll try to do the perpendicular bisector. Let's see it. Uh, 
That works, but guess what? These guys are on the same line, so we better circle them. So it's actually, the question is what isn't a support vector? Only this, only those three. Question? In one dimension, I mean, you just proved that actually, you just showed that those ran on the same line, so you really didn't need like the cosine term and the sine term. You could have done all this with just the cosine. All right, the question is couldn't we have done this in one dimension? All we would do is do only the cosine. So if we did only the cosine, um, then they would have still been divide easily divisible. The answer is absolutely, we could have. However, the question did not because Susan Q. Random student decided to do cosine and sine. But yes, if we had said, you, 654 student, find a phi that will work for this, you could have found a phi that was just cosine. It would have been easier. However, it's important to be able to work with what somebody else gives you. In this case, they gave you, um, they gave you that transformation, which, yeah, was a wasteful with an extra dimension. You didn't need the sine because you didn't need the y-axis really here. Um, you just needed the x. Does everyone see this? How this works? Can maybe transform dimensions? The main hardest part is they'll usually give you a k and ask for a phi, or give you a phi and ask for a k. But it's not too bad. Just remember, if they give you a phi, do a dot product with it. And if they give you a phi that's just one component, dot product of one component is just multiplying it together. Easy enough. If they give you a K, treat it as a dot product and try to reverse engineer. It's usually something like this that's easy to reverse engineer. I really haven't seen it where it's not. So it may look, it, may, it, it often looks like the scariest problem, but it's usually not too bad to go between phi's and K's. Does anyone have any questions on anything that we did on support vector machines? Question. The question is, what is the intuition? What is W? W is the dividing line. It's the drop-dead dividing line. When I say the drop-dead dividing line, you like those big, bold, solid lines over there. Those are your pretty certain lines. Everything past that was a minus in your, in your training set. Everything past the plus, the big, bold line there was a plus in your training set. But the dotted line is the one you're really going to use in the test data. In the test data, when push comes to shove, you might get something that's inside of that gutter. And if it's on the, um, say, of that one up there, if it's on the up left side of that dotted line, you're going to call it a plus. So that dotted line is your decision boundary. And that is, um, that is basically the idea. And in fact, the way that the algorithm would do it on the computer is it would quadratically optimize the alphas, which messes around with the dotted line. And um, by quadratically alpha maximizing the alphas, alphas, you see how the alphas add up to a W. It just checks it around. And eventually it finds, oh, making the alpha of this one zero makes, the, uh, makes it a better optimization. You're trying to get the widest possible road. It would eventually come out to this. This is trivial for a human to eyeball. But some real problems with 200 data points that have to get one or two of them wrong, classified, and so you may be using a quadratic kernel or something like that, you can't do that. You just can't. Well, maybe you can, in which case, you should be getting a MacArthur uh, Fellowship or something like that, but the computer can't. And the basic idea is when it comes down to it, it figures out the alphas that give it the, be the best W for a widest road, and the W is your decision boundary. Good question. Any other questions about um, our old friend, SVM? Uh, I have a question for you. Um, after seeing this, and let's pretend that they only ask you to solve for Ws, Bs, you know, these kind of kernels and phi's, which are the typical things. How many people now think that um, you can go through and work an SVM problem? All right, we've got, we've got a few. We've got a happy few. Uh, band of brothers, maybe eight people raised their hand there. That's good. How many people know what a support vector is now? That's really good. Because that, if that's all you learn from today's mega recitation, it's still good. It really is. I'm telling you, I had to take two classes on this and then TA it before I really, really understood it. So you guys are ahead of me. All right. Take care. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you for boosting and vampires next week. <laughs>